okay, you need to switch billing systems. How do you how do you convince somebody to do that? Because that seems like the last thing that anyone would ever want to do once you have one yeah. in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I guess also like it's also a very big difference if, if it is actually working, right? At least for the moment or if it's not. Uh, but I do think that uh, one big area is experimentation. Is it flexible enough to maybe, you know, see another business model next year? Uh, I think most companies have a need to change pricing, experiment, optimize. Maybe they are buying another company. Maybe they are adding a product line. Maybe they are, you know, addressing a new segment. All of that requires a change, right? And we're back for another episode of the Startup Hustle. This is your host, Matt Watson. Very excited to be joined today by Nicholas Lilia. He is the founder and CEO of Unium, who is a SaaS billing subscription type of company. We're going to be talking about all the struggles of trying to build billing into your software, which has been a nightmare for me and my own SaaS product. So he'll shed some light on that. Tell us about his business, um, his entrepreneurship uh, journey. Before we get started, I do want to remind you, if you need to hire software developers, you can check out my company, Fullscale. We have 300 employees working for dozens of other tech companies, front-end, back-end, mobile, QA, whatever you need help with, check us out at fullscale.io. Nicholas, welcome to the show, man. Thanks. Great to be here. I'm, I'm so, staring at scale. That sounds good. <laughs> In the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, It says Fullscale, but you know, we're just... We're stuck in scale, I guess, which is good. It's cut off there. So your company you started in 2017 is actually based in Sweden. And, you know, it's not very often we hear about companies that are in Europe that are moving to the U.S. It's usually companies like my previous companies that are in the U.S. or trying to figure out how to move to Europe. So what what's it like starting a company in Sweden? Good question. I, I, I do think it's um, uh, quite easy from an administrative point of view. If we do that, I think that is quite a well organized and good infrastructure. I do also think that we've had quite a few successes over the last few years, which has really sort of paid the way for us uh, and a quite a good tech scene as well. Uh, so, so uh, fairly straightforward, uh, especially compared to like twenty years ago, where I think it was quite different, uh, especially from a cultural standpoint. No. A good start, a very small pond to be in, quite a small country, but still fairly far ahead when it comes to SaaS tech. So I think it was a good start for us. So what gave you the idea to start this company originally? Did you have another SaaS product or work in another tech company and have had all sorts of nightmare with, with doing billing and you're like, I got to solve this? Like, how did, yeah, how did you get yeah. into this? Exactly, exactly. Um, exactly doing that. So I was with another company called Media Studio. Supply invoice automation back then, uh, sort of doing in in the procure to pay process, uh, and, and was looking into this and and sort of going through the alternatives out there on the market and figure like, hey, it doesn't seem like this category is set. It doesn't seem like you know it's all done and 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 we're with yet. So let's get into this and and do things a bit differently. So that's where we got started. So very much from a very practical standpoint, we didn't do much of research. We had to stay into development, right? Well, so there obviously are competitors, right? Like there, there's, you know, several different companies that do this, but especially back then, were there none of, none of the like American based companies not selling into Sweden? Uh, they were, they were, uh, I, I guess like from a, from a U.S. standpoint, Sweden is not like the, <laughs> it's not the biggest right. market. So, so that, it's quite natural. You, you don't expand to, to Sweden first, uh, but they were there definitely. And I think in this age as well, like country boundaries are not as, uh, difficult to cross as they used to yeah. be. Right. So, so there were definitely alternatives, uh, I do think if we are to generalize, I, I think U.S. companies are maybe not that good at seeing sort of different regulatory needs and, and a lot of small countries with different laws and regulations and best practices and how to adopt with that. On the other hand, European companies typically come from that scenario, so we're not as good at 
sort of scaling in a very big market that is a bit more, um, I would say, like. Uh, we so, we just uh, pretend those laws don't exist. <laughs> there, there's been cases like that, right? It's like but, GDPR. Like when GDPR came out, yeah, yeah, yeah. like everybody thought that was like the biggest thing for like a year and everybody was freaked out about it. And then like, I never even hear about that anymore. I guess we have the big companies hearing about it, right? In the courtrooms yeah. and doing the big you know, fights over it. Uh, I guess like all companies have done something, maybe, maybe not thorough and in all details, but they've done something. I, I would guess at least. But yeah. So starting, so starting the company in Sweden, how many SaaS companies do you think there are in Sweden? Like, what was your target market there, you know, within your own country that you could have sold to? Yeah, so a very small set. I think we counted to like 200 or 250 companies, maybe. And then that, that is not the, like all the SaaS companies, but it was like all the SaaS companies in B2B of a certain size and, you know, yeah. all the criteria we had around our ideal customer profile. And then we ended up around 200, maybe 250, 300, but, but really, really small digits. Uh, and I think that is something that we've carried with us along our journey as well, like trying to always um, sort of make the, the, the market smaller. How can we sort of scale down <laughs> Target market. Well, it's a lot easier. That's the way that we become bigger, right? Otherwise, right. you become, you know, no one on, in a very, very big market. So, so that is uh, maybe that's why we've had that with us along the way, right? How can you make the market smaller? How can you be bigger, <laughs> relatively? So, yeah. so from the very beginning, were you selling internationally, or were you only selling in Sweden when you started? Uh, so when we started, I was selling. Uh, Mainly all around Stockholm, so which is the capital of Sweden. So definitely very, very, very small. And then, and then within a year or two, we we uh, expanded into the Nordics, and then we set up a hub in Amsterdam, Netherlands as well. So sort of expanding out into Europe, uh, pretty much on the same sort of model and and how we've done it. Uh, but since we were very, very picky and detailed about our ideal customer profile, we, we ended up with geographical expansion as the expansion strategy. So did you have to make many changes to the software for that? I mean, you have just language, currency, date, you know, stuff like that, or other weird laws and things? or I think less, less than we had anticipated, really. We, we had a few like core elements built in from the start, like multi-company, multi-currency, and, and, and all of that. And since we're also targeting like software, SaaS, B2B, you know, companies are quite similar, regardless of what country you come from. You sort of listen to the same co- podcast, you read the same books, you have the sort of same heroes. I, I guess if you were into like, I don't know, like manufacturing or retail or something else, it would be bigger differences, I think. But in this like small bubble, um, the similarities are quite big. But still, yes, there are things that we, we did not so much like in the core product, but very much when it comes to ecosystem and, and the connectors to other systems. So typically you have like CRM, perhaps you have a few more global players, um, you know, like Salesforce or HubSpot or something. Yeah. But if you're talking about financial systems, um, you typically have a few big ones, but then you have local players, right? So you, you have the QuickBooks Online in the US, whereas in the Netherlands you use Exact Online maybe. Or, you know, in Sweden, it would be Fort Knox. And you have okay. all these, like, local players. It's, uh, so it's called Fort Knox in Sweden? Yeah, but, but in, a, <laughs> in a slightly different spelling, though. Uh, yes, but yeah, they, 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 are, they are the ones. Because I'm pretty sure Fort Knox <laughs> is in the United States. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's without, without the K, actually. So, so, uh, That's funny. Got wrong with someone. So that is, I mean, so, so more from ecosystem and connected perspective that we really felt like, okay, a way a lot to of integrations is to be relevant in that ecosystem. And yeah. that ecosystem differs between countries. I would say. Yeah. All right. So you start in 2017. When did you come to the US? 2021? Uh, no, 2023. So uh, 23. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
And so, it, and that also brought you here. You moved here then, or when did yeah. you move here? Yeah, I moved. Yeah, so I moved here as well. So I uh, convinced my family that it would be a family adventure, and uh, we packed our suit. It was a bit of a pre-process to this as well, of course, with visas and and everything. But but yeah, quite a quite an adventure actually. Uh, to move to Philadelphia or outside Philadelphia more than a year ago, um, which I think is good. Um, maybe that is uh, an advice, or you know, that. It's not easy understanding how another market is unless you're there. You can read. Yeah, well, so I guess you can listen. Yeah. So after you've been here now for a year or two, what's different? You know, I what now that you've been here? Yeah, I mean, we we all know that the market is bigger, uh, but I think it's also a way of understanding. Like, okay, that means it's noisier. There are always alternatives. You know, there is another dynamic to it. I, I think that is one thing. But it's also, you know, we're quite close to like payments and just understand how payment works here or banks work here. Uh, it's quite different from how it works in Europe or in Nordics, right? So, and, and I don't think you really get that. You, you can read it, you can understand there are differences, but to really feel it and understand what the effects are, I, I think it, it really helps being uh, closer by. Well, is it also a lot but, different from a perspective of like business culture and like how people buy, like just American culture? Is, is that part of it a lot different too? Yeah. I, I think to some extent there is a bit of a difference in terms of people maybe more interested in in like um, what is the result of this in the U.S. and not equally concerned with how we'll get there. Whereas I feel Europeans are maybe a bit more interested in first talk to me about how we get there, so I okay, you, and then we can talk about like what that is. You probably want to touch on both of them, but, but I do feel there is a bit of a difference on how you get there. And maybe that also affects like how you communicate. And, and I think that is also something that just like you have to really over communicate in the US. Uh, like being humble is not necessarily a good positive word in, in, in all aspects. So if you say you, you are 100, I feel people believe you maybe you are 80. <laughs> But if you then start at saying that you are 80, then people will think you're only 60, right? So, so I think like always sort of, it's always competing, right? And competition. And, and that I think is very different. And, and I can see it with my kids as well. And they go to school and, you know, they're playing a lot more competition everywhere. Okay. Than what we're used to in, in Europe. So I, I definitely think that is something that you have, have to get used to. And maybe add okay. that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so speaking of competition, your guys' product is one of those products that every SaaS company needs, right? Like if you're if you're just billing like forty nine dollars a month or something, eh, it's pretty simple. It's not that complicated. Maybe you can just use Stripe or whatever. Yeah. Not a big deal. But as soon as you get past the complexity of that, it can get really complicated really fast, right? Because so you have yeah. different billing packages and you're paying per the number of users, the number of mm. seats or some kind of other meters, yeah. different pricing tiers and packages, all this stuff. Like billing can be an absolute absurd nightmare. I've been there before and I've told people before that sometimes the billing of their software can be more complicated than what their actual software itself is. Um, <laughs> if you make the billing really complicated. Right. And, yeah. but I, my question for you though, is how do you call up other companies like my old company and be like, okay, you need to switch billing systems. How do you, how do you convince somebody to do that? Because that seems like the last thing that anyone would ever want to do. Once you have one yeah. in place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I guess also like, it's also a very big difference if, if it is actually working, right? At least for the moment or if it's not. Uh, but I do think that uh, one big area is experimentation. Is it flexible enough to maybe, you know, see another business model next year? Uh, I think most companies have a need to change pricing 
experiment, optimize. Maybe they are buying another company. Maybe they are adding a product line. Maybe they are, you know, addressing a new segment. All of that requires a change, right? And, right. and I do think that um, we provide a lot of flexibility in that sense. And we haven't sort of, we, we don't dictate how companies need to run their business. Because I think that is actually one possible unique thing that every company can do. So flexibility and being able to do that uh, is one thing. And I would also like to talk about a bit, a lot of companies maybe started out, let's say they were doing the $49 and then they expanded into $99. And then, you know, they got a system for that. And then they want to move into enterprises. And now they're going to do like three-year deals. They, now they're going to do ramp-up deals. Now they're going to do, you know, all yeah. these strange things. Maybe it was okay for the <laughs> $1 kind of deal and also the $99 yeah. deal, but not necessarily for the enterprise deal, right? So, right. so I think sort of the right fit for it. Uh, and we talked about that in the beginning as well, like where, where we come from. And, and I really want to be that system that becomes a, a good foundation for companies to grow their business on. And then we need to support different ways of doing that, right? I think we definitely have, you know, come a lot from sales-led growth. I mean, every company now today is talking about product-led growth, right? We want to see more self-service. We, you know, but it's not like we want to, maybe we want to switch out the old and in with the new, but typically for most companies, you you need to do both. And that's where we want to be uh, and, and, and provide as well. So, from the get-go, we did usage billing and, you know, more classic recurring fees. We said right. that, okay, you might do consumption-based billing so that you, you know, invoice in arrears or do billing in arrears of what was consumed. But maybe you're also just wanting to do a measurement and comparing, okay, so a customer of yours, you know, bought a package up to 100 users and now they have 102 do you want that to just go through or do you want it to lead to a conversation or, you know, there, there are so many ways of doing this, right? And, and we want to provide the platform for the companies to make these decisions and, 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 you know, become their best. So that's, uh, no, no. So a few examples. The, the, the real world scenario is they signed an annual contract. They paid for the annual contract in advance. <laughs> then they added three, three more users and like, Hey, what do we do with these three users? And then a week goes by, then they cancel five users. Like, hey, now what do we do? Now we have to prorate this. Like, yeah, yeah. All of that is a nightmare. Every single one of those scenarios is a nightmare. But that's why and products like yours are really important. Them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I do think also like really, there, especially in B2B, there's also the time issue, right? So, so we had all of these events, but sometimes, you know, something is sold or agreed to or whatever in December, but it doesn't start until January or February right. when, you know, they have the time to start using it. Um, and then you have revenue recognition on top of that. So what, it, what, yeah. what does the rule says? So all of a sudden you have three revenue measures. Like you have the contacted, you have the recurring revenue, and then you have the recognized. Uh, revenue somewhere as well and and in the worst cases they, they they might all be different and they could all together tell a story and i and i think like having that data model and having all that data accessible so you can actually see okay so we typically sell this at this point and then we have a lead time and this is where it's you know starts going but then this is how we recognize you know all of that tells different stories, and, and I think you need all of that to mold your business and do good decisions. Some things may affect, like you know, your profit and loss, your margins. Others may affect your cash flow. Which one is different? Well, probably both, and, and uh, that's what we well, want to do. We want to provide both. Well, you you just hit on a problem that's a big problem. So my previous company that that had a SaaS product, we used one of your competitor solutions. Mm -hmm. And we had to rely on it for our revenue recognition because when you have different pricing packages, like we had customers paying 200 a month and we had customers paying 50,000 a year, like how much money did we make this month, right? Like you have to deal with all of the accruals of all of that. And then it's not necessarily about when they paid their bill, right? Like you're, you know, one customer pays their bill late, another one pays it on time. 
Like mm. you, all of that is complicated and it feels like accounting, but you know, a, a billing product like yours really helps a SaaS company kind of navigate through all of that. And the more complicated your product and pr- uh, packaging and pricing and all that, the more complicated all that gets, the bigger this problem gets. And you really have yeah. to have a product like yours to even sort through it. Yeah, and I think what you really want is also for everyone in the organization to be able to have one truth that they rely on, right? Yeah. The worst situation is like sales sitting there saying one thing, finance saying another thing, and then you have your operations team saying it different. <laughs> then it becomes really complicated. Yeah. Getting that like one truth. Uh, and I think especially now when, you know, you have to do, be better, right? There's not... <laughs> Money is not as cheap anymore. You know, everyone has to think about like, how can we improve? How can we do things better? How can we be smarter? Where to find the next dollar, etc. Then it becomes, you know, even more important having that data, right? So you're not just guessing. So yeah, very relevant. Yeah, billing is really important, but revenue recognition is really, really, really important as well. And it's kind of a, a problem that people don't think about until they later stumble into it as a problem. Yeah. I do want to I do want to take a second to remind everybody today's episode is brought to you by Full Scale. If you need to hire software developers, definitely check us out. No matter what your tech stack is, we have developers for as little as twenty five to thirty five dollars an hour uh, based out of the Philippines. You can check us out at fullscale.io. Well so you know obviously there's a lot of different kinds of billing you know from mm. basic mm. subscriptions to enterprise and all these mm. other things in between. How, for, especially from the early days, how did you guys stay focused on, okay, we want to do B2B, and did you have people asking you to do weird things that kind of took you away from what you wanted to really focus on? Yeah, I, I mean, in the beginning when you don't have that many customers, I mean, you're maybe not as uh, strong in your belief that your ICP is right. I mean, you have to get to the point where you feel like it's really working, of course. So we did have a few, like going into B2C. uh, I think we quite quickly felt like maybe that was not our thing. Maybe we didn't have, you know, all the passion and all, maybe all the knowledge either. So so B2B was quite straightforward. Um, I would say Pretty, like, just before the pandemic hit, actually, we were also sort of wandering into, you know, more like classic manufacturing, more hardware with added software, IoT, and sort of those kind of scenarios. And we were quite far gone, uh, you know, past all the toll gates about to sign, and then the pandemic hit, and then you know, uh, stop all investment, stop all expenditure. So that didn't happen. And, and, But it is very easy to get sort of, and and that was like a really big deal, probably, you know, (laughs) the size of all our other customers together, but not necessarily exactly our ICP, but, but it's easy to feel like, oh, we did this really well. They are listening to us. They are interested. Oh, the money, you know, is there, et cetera. Uh, So I have to admit a bit of luck as well, I think, uh, that you don't get thrown those curveballs. But I think we quite early on realized that we need to, you know, have criteria for what is an ideal customer profile. If we're going to be lean, if we're going to do this smart, we want to be good at something. We don't want to be mediocre at a lot of things. And then I, I think it's sometimes overlooked, right? That knowledge of a domain, like your customer's domain, that is really important. That is like how you become relevant when you're doing marketing, how you become uh, you know, a trusted advisor is quite a lot easier if you know their industry, if you know what their problems are, etc. And I think we could definitely see ourselves providing you know, our service to a lot of different industries, in looking at a vision you know, many years ahead. Uh, but I think it's also very important to they quite niche and, and, you know, be good at something. I think that is a mantra for us. Be well, really I good. mean, you really have to be best of breed at something to really be successful. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I do think that is difficult if you want to be for everyone. That's the total opposite, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do feel it's a lot of that out there as well. Uh, I think that is especially true when it comes to 
B2B as well, especially if you have then like subscriptions contracts not being all standardized, but they are negotiated and maybe they carry some of the mechanics from that industry, etc. So I, I think it becomes extra important just in the yeah, in the space we're in. So tell us about give us some tips if if I'm a SaaS founder today and I'm thinking about my billing and how I do billing, what tips do you have for me about not to make it complicated, not screw it all up? Like what what kind of tips do you have for me? Uh I I, I think uh, make sure you have a flexible solution that allows you to experiment because probably you won't get it right the first time. And maybe more importantly, I think what is right when you're getting your first customers is probably not necessarily the right thing for the next batch and the next batch. You want to evolve, you want to change, you want to improve. So I, I, that is one thing. If I would start with something, it's about at least understanding sort of what is a good proxy of the value you're providing to your customers. And maybe that is users. More often than not, it's not users. It's something else. Try to find that and start measuring it. A bit regardless if you're going to price on it directly or not. Maybe you need to, you know, find a $99 a month or, you know, some simpler pricing in the start but i think start measuring what could be the price drivers very early on that also provides you with some data and that also allows you to do experiments later on i think another one is m maybe keep it quite simple in terms of your pricing n not making it too complicated but definitely introduce limit okay so th this is okay up to a limit of x you know api calls or you know x documents or x you don't necessarily have to have the answer what happens beyond x but you're at least introducing some sort of scoping of of the service you're providing and i would also align you know pricing a lot with the terms as well it's very easy to see pricing as something standalone uh, for me it's very related to all terms whether it's you know the billing frequency which is quite common but it could also be the you know the initial term length is it just month to month or is it an annual or is it a three-year contract what role does that play for you right now uh, but i would say figure out like what is the best proxy for value and, and measure that that's probably my my best how my best how advice. often do you think yeah. people change their their billing mo their billing in one way or another uh, deliberately planned and thoughtfully uh, not often enough maybe like once a year or like once every third years i think a lot of companies do it ad hoc when it comes to the, like negotiated deals. They do one-offs. They run into a partner setup. They do something, you know, that they figure things out. And I don't have all the science here, but I'm quite convinced that the more frequent you would update and optimize your pricing, the more, more money you're going to make. I think it's well, as easy as that. I think there are so many companies also just like leaving money on the table. I think there are many companies who have the right to, you know, like increase their prices, you know, with X every year or, you know, with an index or, you know, if we have inflation or whatever. It could be an old model. It could be a new model. It doesn't matter. But a lot of that is never executed upon because they don't know how. And well, that's there's, a very bad reason. There are other better there's reasons a couple... for not doing it. There's a there's a couple of things there, right? Like it's yeah, one thing yeah. to say most companies should raise their prices every year or two as well, right? Like just doing general price increases. Mm -hmm. People leave a lot of money on the table because they're scared to do yeah. a, a price increase, yeah. which I've yeah. rarely yeah. seen be that big of a problem. But the the bigger issue with kind of changing the pricing model is it's like every time you add a new feature or you know, you're you're adding new yeah. major new features to your product, that might complicate your billing, right? It's like, well, now we have a new package or especially with all this AI yeah. stuff, we're like, oh, it's $99 a month, but it does yeah. 
this thing only 10 times. Well, now if they want to do it 20 times, you're like, well, crap. How do we adjust our billing so we can bill them extra if they want to do it 20 times instead of 10 times or whatever? And these are all the little things that seem like little things. But then when you get into the billing, it's like a yeah. total disaster nightmare to figure out. Like, well, how are we going to charge for this thing? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. you come in and save the day. We do. And, and I think that is your point on because I think there has been a belief that uh, we can use sort of the e-commerce, very static sort of non-customizable, highly standardized pricing schemes. And we just use that and the associated tools and system and put it into an enterprise context. I think that is where you go wrong. I think you need a bit of separate tools if you're going to do enterprise these, a bit of separate tools if you're going to do more like online sales or more standardized, um, maybe self-service, etc. But in the end... <laughs> You still want to talk about, you know, your AR. You still yeah. want to see, like, how much money are we getting in in March? You know, when you're talking about that, you don't really care where it comes from. <laughs> when are we going to make the investment? Well, you know, money is money. So, so I, I, yeah, I think you're right. And important to separate those two streams as well. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed having you on the show today. And um, I was curious if you have any other final tips for other entrepreneurs out there uh i guess the the obvious be brave i think uh you know uh, narrow down your icp I, I think ideally if you can find you know get it to be 50 companies then it's very graspable you you can understand okay you can you can you can draw 50 names on the board start kicking them off i i think like getting to that level of practicality i think is 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 very good you're not really sacrificing anything. You're just getting going. So, so I think that is um, that is the tip for the day. All right. Well, again, if you need to hire software developers, don't forget to check us out at Full Scale. Um, we are um, publishing all this on YouTube now. And if you're not subscribed to the Startup Hustle newsletter, you should be. You can go to startuphustlenews.com. Again, this was Nicholas Lilia from Unium. And we'll have a, a link in the show notes to, to your guys' website, uniu.com. You spelled out N-I-U-M.com. Um, if you need help your, with your billing system, definitely check out Nicholas's company. If you have problems with billing, you know how hard it is. <laughs> you, you you can relate to some of our conversation today. Billing's a nightmare. Well, Nicholas, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you.